so this week we've been looking at this whole issue of um, the way the new, th new atheists speak about religion as being the source of the world's big problems. And that's been a very, very loud message, a very prevalent message, and it got into people. It's really got into people's minds. So uh, last year, June, the Huffington Post had a YouGov poll, and that YouGov poll showed that more young people in Britain believe that religion is a cause of evil than a force for good by a long way. So the whole idea that religion is a force for evil has really taken root, certainly in the next generation. It has in the older generation. We've seen that with the way that our posters have been handled in the town. I don't get it face to face with people because it's, I do not have a religious appearance with people, or so it appears, uh, which is cultivated. I don't want to have a religious appearance with people. People are hating. Uh, and they believe it's not just something they don't like. It is a source of evil in the world. So in the lives of 18 to 24 year olds, again it's this YouGov survey, these are the biggest influences young people are saying having on their lives. Religion, and how they are defining that for themselves, is a smaller influence than ever. Okay? Politicians come uh, down there somewhere. Biggest influence, encouragingly in some ways, people who say that the following have influence on them, 82% say that parents do. Now that's fascinating, isn't it? I wouldn't have expected that. 77% uh, say friends have influence on them. That, that's an interesting relationship. Parents bigger than. This is 18 to 25 year olds. 38% uh, say politicians, sorry, that's a 28. It's a 38. 38, I've got to get the right part of my glasses. 38% of people are saying that politicians have a big influence. 32% say brands like Coca Cola or whatever have an influence. Other brands are available. 21% uh, would say that um, celebrities, which is mu much smaller than I thought it was going to be. And 12% say religious leaders have influence on them. That's bigger than I thought it might be. But you've got to take into account it, it's religious leaders that so involves the Muslim community, the Sikh communities, and so on, which are still traditionally close to their religious roots. Now, you know, it runs, it runs right through all of society. It runs right through everybody. Because there was, until this week, there was still one religious correspondent on Fleet Street. Uh, but in the course of this week now, Ruth Gledhill, who's the Times religious correspondent, the last one remaining goes. She'll be made redundant. So you can see this whole thing runs right through society. Religion is perceived as being either irrelevant, often more than that, a source for evil. And it comes down to guys like Richard Dawkins, who, who is a declared prominent critic of religion. He stated his opposition to religion is twofold. Religion is a source of conflict, and we need to look at that, and a justification for belief without evidence, and that obviously is not acceptable to us. We don't think it is belief without evidence, but it's belief on the basis of quite a lot of evidence. And he says that faith, belief that is not based on evidence, is, quote, one of the, one of the world's great evils. So now we're in a situation where, and we're not used to that, perhaps because we haven't come up through that. Our young people are, our kids are, our student workers, people we know who are involved in that, they are involved in a world where most people have been trained up to believe through schools and through voices that they perceive through the media, which have deliberately targeted young people and said so, they believe that religion, whatever that means, is a source of evil in the world. How do you deal with that? Well, Jesus' living in day is not terribly remote from that. Um, I mean, I could go through, I could go through the arguments that... that that uh, Dawkins in particular puts up. 2006, he had a, a, a two-parter on Channel 4 in the UK. Um, and the things that he brings up as objections to religion are things that we say we have nothing to do with that. But that isn't true of us. That isn't the case with us. We are, we are not part of that. So if you're a biblical Christian, you're not part of the things that he's attacking. In some sense, there's a straw man being set up. You know, he goes off to Lourdes and he shows you all this man-made religious stuff. And... Uh, and, and criticizes it, well, so would I. Um, he talks about uh, irrational doctrines in the Roman Catholic Church on the basis of sciences against faith. Well, actually, no, those are irrational, and so on. So John Horton, who is uh, the former CEO at the Met Office, founding member of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, so that makes him a Nobel Prize winner, he says this, he's an evangelical Christian, I've always argued that science and faith can exist side by side and mutually support each other. I believe this applies to discussion and debate about origins. Um, so 
basically Dawkins is saying science is against religion because he's using it that way. It's a partial use of evidence that, that leads him to do that. And so on and so on. Um, lots of things we could say about that involving talk of Russell's teapot. If you want to talk about Russell's teapot, I'll talk about that argument perhaps a bit later. He picks on sectarian education. Well, you know, uh, we, we do try to have our kids involved in normal schools, don't we? You know, salt and light. Yeah. Uh, so I wouldn't, wouldn't wear that one. Um, he talked about religion as being a virus, uh, an idea, behavior, or style that spreads from person to person within a culture. I hadn't noticed that. <laughs> that, that was how it was working, quite, to be honest. Um, you know, don't, we're not wearing that one. Not, not as we understand Christian faith. Um, one thing we do have to deal with with him is the whole issue of biblical morality. He mounts this attack on, on morality in Scripture. That is, a, that is chat about the Bible. Uh, it's just that he decides what is moral and what isn't and then applies it backwards into God. Uh, so that, that is, there's a lot to be said about that, a lot to be done on that. And of course, Alistair McGrath, who's a professor of, um, he was professor of historical theology at Oxford. He's now the professor for the understanding of science and religion. Um, and he's working a lot more on that. He's, he's dealt with him very effectively to his great embarrassment. Uh, but of course, those bits don't get put onto the television. The way Jesus deals with the problem with the religion in his day, there was a problem. The ordinary people of the land were alienated from religion in Jesus' day. We forget that. The established structures of religion were inimical to them. Let's put it like that. They were just a nauseating burden to them. And they were critical of them, and they were looking down on them, and they were judgmental. So the people of Jesus' day have got a problem with the religion that's kicking around. And Jesus comes into that, and fascinatingly, he is very confident about distancing himself from religion in his day. And Jesus does that deliberately. He does it strikingly. He does it in a way that many would consider rude to make his point. And he's doing it in the passage we're looking at today in Mark chapter 3. The question in the back of my mind all the time is that the atheists are actually striking out at things that are religion for the most part. There are things we have to deal with, about two that we have to deal with that they throw up, uh, involving science against faith and the whole thing about faith not being based on anything rational. We deal with those two things happily. Um, in his day, he had to distance himself from the religion of his day that people were finding not to their needs or liking. And here we have a situation where it is the religious thing that's being justifiably, we'd say, criticized. And, and I'm, I'm saying if Jesus had to distance himself and distance God from religion in his day, don't you think we should have to do that ourselves in our own? So here at the start of his Galilean ministry, as recorded in Mark, here's Jesus stepping up to the plate and doing just that. Let's learn that because it applies, definitely applies to the challenges that we're facing over religion in our day. So I've been dealt with all of that. Here's the first challenge to Jesus on the basis of, well, religion. Uh, chapter 2 of Mark, verses 13 to 17, the first challenge and first of all, uh, setting the scene. Jesus is again in the region of Capernaum. He went out again by the sea, and the whole crowd came to him, and he taught them. He's in by the Sea of Galilee, towards the northwest corner, that thriving busy bit, not the deserty bit down on the right-hand side bottom, but the top left-hand side. Uh, he's around there. And his teaching has been there with authority, and his signs and wonders have borne testimony to the idea that he has authority. In fact, the idea that he's Daniel 7's son of man. God in the flesh, come to save mankind from sin and destruction. And we've seen all that stuff already about how the man being let down through the roof, Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. And he gets up, it backs up his, his teaching ministry to, do the, to be doing these things. Okay, this sets the scene then for the episode that's now going to be played out before us. Here's the incident. Did you realize last week was the 175th anniversary of the Rebecca riots. Did you know that? I just thought I'd slip in a contemporary reference. Um, men in dresses again, a bit like Eurovision last week. Men in dresses, no beards. Well, maybe be, I don't know. Uh, tearing down toll booths on Carmarthenshire roads. Um, people had put in these roads and they were charging people for moving, moving their goods, doing their commerce down those roads and it couldn't be afforded. Uh, clash of understandings perhaps, but, but there we are. That's what was happening. Jesus is walking along and uh, he comes up against the toll booth. So Jesus goes out by the sea and the whole crowd comes to him 
and he taught them. And as he went along, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the booth. Follow me, he said to him. He got up and followed him. Interestingly enough, uh, this seems to be a walking church that Jesus is running. Now, this is unusual, isn't it? How about this? Jesus, again, has got a walking church. We see him walking with his disciples and teaching them and so on. But here, I don't know how you do this. But the whole crowd comes to him and he's, he's teaching them as he goes along. And the original makes it absolutely clear. Kai Parago and Aiden Levi, Ton to Alphio, so Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the receipt of custom, sitting at the Telonio, tel it's, it's, the, it's the, the booth by the side of it, taking the tolls. It's that sort of thing. You get the picture in your heads. You got that clear. So there's this highly unusual thing going on. Jesus is walking along, teaching a huge crowd. How do you, how do you walk? And is he walking backwards? I've got no idea, right? But they're all attending to him. They're listening. And as he goes along, he sees this guy called Levi, son of Alphaeus, moving as he was teaching. And then uh, he saw Levi. Same guy as Matthew in other Gospels. Levi here emphasizes for us he was a Levite from the Jewish priestly caste. Okay? And he was sat at a toll booth. Now, that he was sat at a toll booth is odd and explicable. The explicable bit is this. There's a toll booth there to be sat at. Capernaum was on the border between the Tetrarchies of Herod Antipas and Philip the Tetrarch. <clears throat> so it's on the borders of these governmental regions. And as you come out of Capernaum, there on the trade route running out of town, there's a toll booth. Go to France, you'll see that sort of thing. Except there they, it's different because here they're charging you according to your goods. It's a tax on the goods that you're transporting. But for Matthew the Levite to be sat there as Telonis is really an act of outright religious apost apostasy and immorality. And here's why. Matthew is collecting not the hated poll tax that the Romans have been levying from AD 6 onwards. You know, a, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. So every man went up to his own city to register. That's this hated poll tax the Romans Im imposed on people from around the time when Jesus was, was born, around about then. It's not that one, it's this, uh, you want to bring your goods down here, we're going to tax your trade. I suppose it's your VAT of the day, is it? It's like that sort of thing. And we know there was this thriving fishing industry going on in the Sea of Galilee, and it thrived on the exports to the other regions. Can you see what's happening? So Peter, James and John, what do they think of the Teleones? What do they think of the bloke who sits at the booth? They want to catch him on a dark night when nobody's looking, don't they? Yeah? And here's Jesus walking along with these guys in the crowd, and he goes up to the booth and he sees a guy who is completely, utterly unacceptable to the tradesmen and to the religious, and he goes, follow me. Jaws drop. He's working for the dreaded, nasty, horrible Romans, doing a job nobody wants him doing, and he's doing it as a Levite. Answerable to a middleman who answered to Herod Antipas for the revenue that was being raised. He collected taxes for Rome. He was despised by the Jews. They undoubtedly regarded him as a traitor and an outrageous sinner. And you can tell how unpopular these guys were by the fact that the dinner that follows is attended only by sinners and social outcasts like him. <clears throat> follow me, said Jesus to him. And he got up and followed him. Jesus does not get that faithful response from the religious. He gets it from the sinners. And the religious don't like it. So verses 15 to 16, they challenge it. Please notice this. Jesus is on walk in church, right? It's not just a journey that's initiated here with Levi by that lakeside that day. It's a lifelong relationship with Jesus. And the, the language of follow me is becoming the language of discipleship. So those who are Christians are actually followers of Jesus. It's not those who self-identify as I am Christian. It is not those who turn up and follow the observances. It is the people who follow Jesus. And he's establishing that from the start. Does that make sense? Or is that point clear? It's the actual followers and not the ones that, as we'll see, who sign up for the various observances and so on. We'll see that that becomes relevant. So, as Jesus was having a meal, <laughs> this is great, the way this is sort of slipped in, Mark is a superb storyteller, and, and he's sort of hitting people with stuff as he just goes along in the most nonchalant sort of way. Bang! Get that. Okay? The, crowd goes out, uh, the whole crowd comes to Jesus out by the sea, teaches them, Levi at the tax booth, follow me. He got up and he followed him. As Jesus was having a meal at the house, what? 
That is just a jaw dropper again. Jesus is having a meal in Levi's home. That, that breaks every social convention, let alone the rules of the religious. As Jesus was having a meal in Levi's home, many tax collectors and sinners, hamartoloi, they mean it, they are scruffy, were eating with Jesus and his disciples because there were many who followed him. There were many, and they're all bet with this, this church of the ragamuffins. We've had walk-in church, now we've got church of the ragamuffins. When the experts in the law and the Pharisees saw that, he was eating with sinners and tax collectors. He said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And many in the crowd listening to Mark are going to say, yeah, that's a good point, actually. What's he doing there? Do you see? It is an outrageous thing. It is a bombshell. I'm, I'm trying to, I don't want to flog a dead horse, but, but this is a bombshell. What does he think he's doing? What a scruffy herbert. What's he doing there? Now, we've got to be aware of this. Um, you, you come across, in, in logic, you get a thing called an argument ad hominem, right? And an argument, you learn lots of stuff here, don't you? Um, the argument ad hominem goes like this. This point of view is uh, being expressed by a person who is disreputable. Therefore, the point of view is disreputable. Uh, painting it with a big broad brush, but you see the point. You're arguing from the character of the person who's putting this point across that it isn't true. But actually it doesn't work like that, because sometimes some pretty dodgy people say some things that are absolutely right. Yeah? So that's what's going on here. Jesus sitting down to a meal with sinners. Not just a ritual thing for the religious of Jesus' day. They made it a moral issue too. It was immoral to do this. According to their rules, according to their regulations, which are many. So, the idea is you discredit the argument on the basis of what he's doing. You discredit Jesus' gospel because he goes and mixes it with tax collectors and sinners. That's what's going on. And Jesus did share his life with tax collectors and sinners as if no one was any better than that. Because actually no one is. That is the problem with religion. It turns away from the gospel. Because the natural Pharisee lives in all of us. Doesn't it? Jesus has stepped into close spiritual table fellowship. Accepting, and that really is the word, accepting into his fellowship the social and religious outcasts of his day. And with it, he is cutting right across the divisiveness that religion currently stands accused of. It was just, look, I'm just going to, it was such a joy yesterday to be with some people who were up against it. I was visiting around here. And to be with a lady whose daughter has just been left by a partner and the doll won't do anything for three weeks. And, no, 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 right? You will never know from me who it was. Never. But to be in a position where, having chatted with somebody for a little while, and they see a little bit of what you're about, they're prepared to talk to you because you're not a judgmental herb, but they expect every religious person on their door to be. Do you know, for my own sake, apart from anything else, I need to spend more time on the doors. Just meeting ordinary people. We've got to break down the perception of, of religion that exists here as it did for Jesus beside the Sea of Galilee that day. And somehow, this is off the top of my head, I just wonder whether we've got to manage to do it in such a way that we're not... We've got to be able to do that regardless of whether they come on a Sunday. Because Levi wasn't coming on a Sunday. Well, Jesus does this to the extreme annoyance of the religious leaders of his day. And they take him on for it. And I find it really, it, it can throw me when, when I'm trying to do that sort of thing, and then the religious leaders of the day are the ones who give me jit. Bit of, a, bit of an adjustment in thinking needs to go on there. And I speak to guys, I speak to other younger fellas, tend to be... Um, doing church planting and stuff around the place, and they find exactly the same, and they think it's only them not. Jesus had it too. Look at it. The religious leaders of his day come along and they accuse him. Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? There's the finger. See the finger? You can't, you can't read that without the finger, can you? There's the finger. Why does he eat? And Jesus replies to the accusation of the, of the religious in two parts. Those words, sinners and tax collectors, they keep getting repeated. He, he, he tries to reply in a way that maybe they can grasp this. 
Maybe. Because we don't write off the religious, do we? Maybe they're going to get this. So he tries to win them with a little proverb that everybody can agree with. Verse 17. Where is it? Oh, there it is on the bottom. When Jesus heard this, he said to them, those who are healthy don't need a physician, but those who are sick do. Does that make sense? It's beautiful, isn't it? I mean, you can tell that in that guy, the intellect that formed the world is operative, because that is genius. Genius in that situation. I'm in a situation in the market every now and again, where, you know, quite often actually. What, what they want is an answer. They need the, the rev to give a good answer. They long for the rev to have a good answer, because they would love to believe some of the stuff I believe. But really, that's ridiculous, isn't it? But they just need to know the Rev's coming with a good answer to that. Somebody's chipped in something, and they just need to know there's a good answer. And I know what it's like sometimes to be standing and thinking, Lord, what's the answer to this? <laughs> Lord, quick, what's the answer? And you're dealing with the mind that formed the world. Look at that. Look at the genius in that. Look, it's not the healthy you need a doctor. It's the sick, isn't it? Quotes them a proverb they can't disagree with in the third person to show general applicability. And secondly, he goes on and states the whole purpose of his mission, personally, in the first person singular. He explains his ministry. I haven't come to call the righteous, but sinners. And that's what it's about. Now, why this is so genius is that the Pharisees were scribes, and that's the group he's dealing with here. They thought they were trying to make religion accessible to the ordinary people through their religion. That's why they made all these rules, so people can see and get on with it. Not as simple as that. So Jesus is saying, not only, look, you understand this about a physician and the people who are sick and everything, right? Only the sick need a doctor, but also I've come to call the right, not the righteous, but sinners. And you're actually, by all your rules, saying that's what you're doing, but actually you're making it impossible. Because ordinary people could not keep up with the rules. Because you can't. Because that's human nature. So then he goes on and he gives them another one. <laughs> this, is the, this is where he gets really, really angry making for Pharisees. Okay, you ready? No one pours... Oh, and no one... We're on the next bit, aren't we? Have I gone too far? Yeah, I've, I've clicked down too far. I've not come to call the righteous but sinners. The whole point of Jesus and his ministry is he's come to call sinners. Those then who are righteous think they are righteous, we call that self-righteousness, don't we? So those who are self-righteous have got nothing to do with being the people of Jesus because we come to call sinners to repentance. Is that making sense here? Now we know there are churches out there that in practice or in theory or you know, whether it's enshrined in their principles or whether it's just done in their practice, that's where they stand. We're okay. We're the okay ones. The big thing we're up front with is this, we are not the okay ones and that's why we're followers of Jesus. Jesus' answer and then consistent with that idea that following him involves fishing for men, not curating a fish tank. Right? We're not fish tank curators, we're fishers of men. And that's a very important principle. It's a very important principle to be noted in this new atheist attack on religion. They're attacking what we're not about. And Jesus stands apart from religion and he does relationship with him. Now that sounds really smug, doesn't it? Just, just, just take it on board. Jesus is not doing religion. He's doing relationship with him. Things go wrong with that slips. For all of us. He's doing relationship with the class of repentant rejects. That's who. In my daily readings yesterday, alongside Exodus 36, which is terribly enlightening bit about the building of the tabernacle in the wilderness and where you put rings and bars and all the rest of it, right? Where you stick the cloth up. Uh, which is great, it's got an important part of God's word. Um, I, I, with, with relief I broke then into John chapter 17, which was the next bit of reading. And there in John chapter 17, Jesus' farewell discourse, he's preparing his disciples to leave them. Okay? That farewell discourse with the disciples on the night that he was betrayed into the hands of the Jewish authorities, right at the heart of that event, Jesus says, John chapter 17, verse 3, Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. 
This is eternal life to know you. It's relationship, not ritual. Who rejects, who repent. And he prayed for the twelve, and he prayed for all who'd come to believe in him through their ministry. And very soon the religious people of his day betrayed him into the hands of the godless people of his day. Get that, that is so important a principle. The religious people of the day betrayed him into the hands of the godless of the day. And then the religious insisted that the godless killed him. Is that making sense? If we're serious about following Jesus, that's where we're going to stand too. And bear in mind, the fire we get, the incoming flack we get, can get pretty heavy. We are not about religion. We will not be grouped there, whether that, that's what the atheists are attacking or what. It doesn't matter. Uh, we're about all that's wrong about us, all that's revolution in relationship with Jesus. And that's a slippery target for new atheists. Here's the clear reason Jesus has come. Not to call the righteous but sinners. We know what he's come to call sinners to, because Mark has spelled out as his message from chapter 1, verse 15 onwards. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, believe the gospel. Come follow me. I'll make you fishers of men. That is the essential creed. Come do this. Now that's crucial context for what comes next. Because Jesus goes on to teach us about the redundancy of religion with his eye clearly on both... The Pharisees and the disciples of John who have not yet seen what John was pointing them to in Jesus. I think there are many about like that. Disciples of John. In the churches who have not yet seen what they're being pointed to in Jesus. If that isn't relevant to the mission situation right here in Wales today, I have no idea what is. When the experts in the law... The Pharisees saw that he's eating with tax collectors and sinners. They said to his disciples, why did he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said, those who are healthy don't need a physician, but those who are sick, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And the passage that follows works out what follows from that and really puts the icing on the cake. And there it is. John's disciple and disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. All that follows is aimed at those two groups. For our edification. So they came to Jesus and said, why do the disciples of John and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples don't fast? Why aren't you fasting? And Jesus said to them, the wedding guests cannot fast while the bridegroom is with them, can they? So here's how it was. The adherents of the two thriving, buzzing religious movements of the day were on a fast day. Be sure, be clear. The two thriving, going somewhere, religious movements of the day were the disciples of John and the Essene community and all that stuff down by the Qumran, down by the Dead Sea, down in the desert, doing all that stuff down there, and the Pharisees, because they, they, they were thriving. You had to be rich to be one, you had, but they were you know, buzzing. The Sadducees, on the other hand, were just, you know... But, but these two were the buzzing ones, okay? Proceeding stories about feasting. This one's now about fasting. Not exactly a major uh, <coughs> concern of those who are sick and need a doctor to who Jesus came. But they're on about fasting because that's their big deal. What Jesus' disciples and Jesus by implication are being criticised for here then is not any failure to observe scriptural practices, but failure to conform to the extra-biblical practices of these admittedly thriving religious groups within Judaism. And Jesus' group is therefore seen to be distinct from these other attempts to breathe fresh life into Judaism in his own time. How that emerges is as the Jesus movement is getting attacked for not taking its religious observances seriously enough. So here's the Jesus movement. Characterized by celebration rather than solemnity. As the coming of the long-awaited kingdom of God and his saving Messiah are the wedding feast to establish religion's funeral march. See what Jesus is saying? You don't fast when the bridegroom's with you. And in those circumstances, you can see how the religious might conclude that Jesus and his followers are not taking their religious observances seriously enough. I mean, fancy having a church walking along. Where are the hymn books? We handed them out. Where's the pulpit gone? Pews? 
They came to Jesus and said, why do the disciples of, of John and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples don't fast? In fact, the only regular fast day prescribed in the Old Testament is on the Day of Atonement. And the one who's bringing atonement has come. But Zechariah 8.19 shows that by the period after the exile, four annual fasts have been added. We must have some more. And Esther 9.31 adds another. See how the rules creep in? See how the natural inner Pharisee takes over and needs putting back in his box? Phariseeism itself had gone far beyond that. Luke 18.32 refers to their twice weekly fast. They fast, I think, on a Monday and a Thursday to show people how religious they were. We've got rules, you know. Standards. Jesus makes it absolutely clear in Matthew 6, 16 to 18, these fasts were made the subject of considerable outward show. Fast bragging was common. Right? And it would have been better if those who questioned Jesus had no idea that the disciples of the Pharisees and of John were fasting at all. They shouldn't have known about it. Well, the explanation proceeds like this. Jesus doesn't talk to them so much about fasting. He says, look, little proverb. Did the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom's with them? Surely that's the time for feasting. Pithy proverb relating to the situation. He tells a set of them now, and that, that, the way he does this is absolutely amazing. Okay, Jesus does not reply by dismissing fasting as an obsolete Old Testament practice. There are people who do. Frankly, he doesn't. Because he says, once he's gone away, then his disciples will fast. Look at Matthew 6, you'll see all about that. And you can look at the example of the, the New Testament church, Acts 13, 2, 3, Acts 14, 23. Yeah, when he'd gone away, they did fast. I'm not with fasting, it's not about that. But he picks up this illustration of a bridegroom. He's making messianic claims. It suggests a new beginning, a fresh start with something new. It's a veiled messianic claim. Even more so because in the Old Testament it is Jehovah himself. It is the covenant God who is described as Israel's bridegroom. In Isaiah 61 and, and, and 52 and, and Hosea 2. Fasting doesn't fit with rejoicing. And while the bridegroom is there, it's not appropriate to go around with a long face fasting. So here's the proverb which, which all will agree. When the bridegroom is removed, then there'll be the time for fasting. And then there are two following little um, things that come along with that. Two little proverbs that come with it. This first one about the difficult one about the old cloth and the new garment and the whatever. You know, the new cloth on the old garment and, and all that. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, otherwise the patch pulls away from it, the new from the old, and the tear becomes worse. Now, <clears throat> sometimes you get a little window on the occurrences in the Bowkett household, and this is, this is one of those occasions. Because yesterday, I'd been out on the tractor, I'd finished my sermon, I just needed to think about it. You know, you know how it is, you've done, you just need to think something through, get it straight, and, and it's changed quite a lot in the process. Which is why I'm not so near my nose. And, um, and uh, I just went out and sat in the tractor, because we've got a lot of rushes, and they need topping off before they set seed at the moment. So I went out and I, I came back in and my long-suffering family were there, they had dinner, I had to be back by half five. And I, I was there by quarter to six, wasn't I? So, wasn't too bad. So I came in and the dinner was there and, and I sort of walked in the kitchen looking for something to drink. Or something. I'd washed my hands already, which is good. And uh, I turned around and, and I said, <laughs> something about my, have you seen your trousers? Well, no, I put the, on the back. And it was a stomping great rip, <laughs> right up, you know, right in the target zone. I mean, obviously... They'd been washed a few times, those jeans, and just as well, and they'd given them an idea. Now, I know better than to approach my long-suffering wife, who made certain sardonic comments about the state of affairs. I know better than to approach her and say, look, can you just put a patch on there? A, it's difficult to get hold of denim. B, it's difficult to get hold of pre-shrunk denim. And even if you use pre-shrunk denim, and this is, this is fold cloth, he's talking, to be technical about this, there's a word, right? And the word means he's used fold cloth, but it's not weathered cloth that's being sewn onto this rip. Okay. It's been weathered, but it's still not. You can't stick something that looks as if it's been poshed up and is, you know, right for the job. It isn't. You stick that piece of fold but unshrunk cloth on an old garment and the patch pulls away. Now notice what happens here. It's not just the patch pulls away. It leaves both in a worse state. It leaves both in a worse state when you do that. 
Are we okay on the cloth one? It's not a matter of incompatibility, but of the destructive results of attempting a compromise between the new and the old. It is destructive. Now you've got to apply that. Where do you apply it? I apply it like this. We don't take a church out in the stick somewhere, a little old chapel, which is basically run on godless lines and say, but there are Christians there as if that's fine. Because it's not. It's destructive. Just think that through. Think through the implications of that because they are very significant. And the religious people of Jesus' day were giving him stick for that the way we get stick for such a comment today. It just needs thinking through. Is that, is that a suitable application? And then there's this other proverb. Now, this, it's, getting, it's getting more fascinating because before we had a proverb, right? Now we've got two in a row, right? No one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins and both the wine and the skins will be destroyed. Instead, new wine is poured into new wineskins. And Ascos is simply a leather bag or a bottle. I've seen them in the desert on the backs of camels. They're great because certainly in that setting you get a certain amount of sort of evapotranspiration and what happens is it cools the water in the bottle. So you use a natural leather bottle, strap it on your camel or your donkey, go off across the desert and you get this sort of slow, low grade evaporation as it permeates through the, and it cools the bag. Brilliant piece of kit. This is a hot climate, do you remember? Okay. So at first you put, you know, you, you, you brew your wine, right? I'm not an expert. You brew your wine. And then there comes a point where you pour it off all that crummy stuff that's in the bottom, yeah? So you leave the lees in the pot. And at that point, they pour it into the, the, the wine bottle. Right? Now, there's a certain amount of fermentation to continue. If you've got a bottle that most of it's gone, but there's a bit left. And uh, if you've got a, a new wine skin, of course, there's a certain amount of pliability left in the leather. If your, water, your wine bottle has been stuck on your camel for a long time in the desert sun, which is a possibility in that climate, then it becomes much more brittle. You know that happens with leather. Okay. So if you take your old wine bottle and you put in your new wine, and that's what it's called, it's called new wine in Greek, okay. if you put that in, then there's going to be a certain amount of fermentation left in the process, and your wine's going to hit the floor, isn't it? It's going to burst under the pressure of fermentation. Now, obviously, the teaching of Jesus, he, he means, you know, it's obviously it's the new wine, isn't it? His teaching is the new wine. And the teaching of both the Pharisees and of John the Baptist's disciples, both, is going to be the old. Confined within the existing religious structures. Caged birds that can't sing. They ain't going to like being told that, are they? They're going to moan and whine and... <laughs> no, they're not. They're going to blow a valve. It's going to get far, far more serious than that. And the attempt to blend the two, wherever it is attempted, will actually cause worse structural damage to both. The new wine falls on the floor and the wine skill skin is ruined. Now, the big thing to notice in this passage is that the principle at stake and the application of this teaching, we had that just now with, the, with the, the former example, the passage just before, the point now is the application of this teaching goes stunningly, shockingly unuttered. He doesn't say it. The principle is not expressed. So you've got proverb, explanation of the principle is spelled out. Then you've got proverb, proverb, no expression of the principle. It's not said. It goes completely unsaid. Of course, the old skins and the old garments are, in this narrative context, the structures of the existing religious tradition, represented by the Pharisees with their scribal tradition, and the newer followers of John the Baptist, who may well have been developing into something like, like the, the desert ascetics we know as the Essene community. A lot of vibrant life about it. Folks who are living down in Qumran. People like them, following in the footsteps of Israel's historic desert prophets. Great, what's happening down there? The attempts to constrain Jesus with existing religious systems have already proved futile. And his followers are going to have to live and be content with the consequences of breaking free of all of that. 
absolutely fascinating me. Dick France. Now, you know Dick France? I know Dick France. He taught me at college. He's an Anglican deacon, right? He never went on and became a priest in the Anglican church. He was an Anglican deacon. He never went there. He was a, a stunning, he died not that long ago, uh, stunningly good Matthew scholar and, and Mark. He's written a really, really good technical commentary on Mark's gospel, which I got earlier this year. Stunningly good. Really good. And it's commentary on the Greek text. And this great scholar, Bible teacher, Anglican deacon, and spent his last 10 or 12 years in, in teaching, teaching in a, an Anglican uh, theological college. He says this, quote, It would be a mistake to confine, confine the relevance of these par parables only to Jesus' confrontation with the scribes and to the specific issues raised in these chapters. It's not just about them, he's saying. The principle is a broader one. As applicable to the constricting influence of Christian traditions as it is to the context of first century Judaism. He's saying, guys, you've got to take this and apply it to Anglican Church today. Without getting a sack. Okay. So, I'm tempted to sit down and not leave, leave no conclusion now, because that's enough, isn't it? But why not? What do you conclude on the basis of that? Every now and again, my friends, you know, my friends, uh, who are sort of ministers or church leaders elsewhere, they say to me, you're a dangerous man. Jesus was a dangerous man. They mean it in love and care, you know. It's not the ones who really think it who say that. It's the others. <laughs> this is dangerous teaching. What are the implications for the way that we deal with the new atheism that, that's trying to come at us, it really is trying to come at us, that has had such a big influence on the young. It really has. You know, trying to reach out to students these days is, is, is different to what it was 10 years ago. They're coming at you with these different questions, aimed at the evil of religion. And Jesus is saying, yeah. He's not trying to defend the indefensible. He's saying, yeah, follow me. Don't try and put new wine in old wineskins. Don't try and sew a new patch of cloth onto an old garment. You come follow me. I'm showing you something that's completely radically new. And we may, we may even just get to the church without hymn books and pews as we walk along by the beach. I hope he's not asking us to do that because I've got no idea how that's done. <laughs> but you see, he is starting a radical Jesus movement, not instituting a religion. And now living with that is quite difficult, but quite essential in missiological terms for our day as much as for his. The way you're smiling and nodding, I think perhaps you're now two dangerous people too. So let me see. Let me see how that goes.